Hey everybody! Today I'm going to do a fun abstract watercolor video with a stamp set from the upcoming Stampin' Up! catalog called You've Got This. It's a nice big floral image and I think you'll like it. I started with some masking fluid and I just spattered it with a paintbrush all over a piece of Stampin' Up! watercolor paper. And this is what part of the stamp set looks like. This is one of two, but I'm going to use that big floral image. Now I'm going to ink the flower up in Daffodil Delight. And you can use any of your dye-based inks for the no-line watercoloring technique. The color absolutely doesn't matter because it will go away when you watercolor. I'm just using Daffodil Delight to get the general shape of the flowers so that I can do a little abstract watercoloring with them. Now I always start by just adding some water to a few of the shapes that I'm going to be coloring in, in this case petals. And here I'm actually using a little bit of core watercolor. I'm using, I don't know how to say this word, quinacridone, magenta. I'm sure there's someone who knows. I don't know or care. All I know is that it's a beautiful color. And I'm deliberately painting petals that are not touching each other. And that's so that I can add water and pigment and let the pigment sort of run through the water the way it wants to. Then by the time I get back around to the initial petals that I colored, I can add some shading because that watercolor will already be dry. Now many of you on my recent blog post where I asked you what technique you wanted to learn, said that you wanted to learn watercolor. So that's why I did this video today. There's also a short version of this video if you don't feel like sitting through 20 minutes of it. I have one that has fast forwarded through the watercolor. But on this one, I thought I'd let you actually see my process. Now I'm adding just a little bit of yellow. In this case, this is Brusho powdered watercolor to some of the areas that I've already painted magenta. And I love what the yellow does. It seems to push red pigments aside and sort of make a way for itself. And I like that. It also blends and makes a nice coral orangey color. So I'll sort of fill in some of the open areas with that. The best thing to keep in mind when you're doing this watercolor is you want to keep it super loose and abstract and not try to be too realistic. You'll lose the spirit of no line watercolor if you're trying to just meticulously paint each petal the way it looks on the stamp. So moving on to the second flower, you can sort of start to see these flowers take shape. This is a beautiful big image and it's going to fill a card front for me. And that's my favorite kind of image to color. Kind of gives me a little room to let the watercolor run. And I just feel like I don't have to be precise. And this technique doesn't lend itself to precision. So that's the perfect kind of stamp image. Now you can see when I pick up darker pigment, I go back into some of the wet areas and add it and let it bleed out. Especially with florals and botanicals, this is a great way to get a very natural look and also to get some shading where you need to get shading instead of covering up the whole thing with a dark color. Now watercolor mediums work great together. That's why I'm using most of the things in this ice cube tray are brusho. But then I have the magenta in the core watercolor. I really didn't have a good magenta in my brusho set. And so this was perfect. Their reds tend to be a little bit more towards the yellow side. 
and feel free to use all those mediums together. They all work great. Watercolors, watercolor. Of course, they have different properties, but they play nicely together. Now, I love adding violet for shading when I'm working with this particular color family. So I'm adding some deep purple from Brusho, sort of for the center of the flower. And you'll see me move from one place to another while I have some of these darker pigments on my brush. You sort of work in stages with watercolor. You want some things to work on when they're wet and some things to work on when they're dry. So I just go back and forth. The most important thing is if things are still wet and they're already the way you like them, move to a different area of what you're working on so that you don't contaminate it or entice the watercolor to get pulled out of the area that you had it in. Now you'll also see that I'm leaving some white spaces on this flower. So I'm departing from the stamp design just a little bit, and that's to add just some highlights to the flower. The masking fluid will also get me some nice splattery highlights, some nice round circles from where it splattered off my paintbrush. But I also do like to leave space because I think it's important to break up these areas of color and just let your eye rest somewhere. Now I have some, it's hard to see right here on the video, but the flowers that I stamped lower than these two that I'm working on also need to be filled in. And I'm using the same color scheme and letting the darker magenta bleed into the wet watercolor areas. Now you'll see that I'm real careful about cleaning my brush with water and then on my mat before I move to another color. That's super important if you don't want your colors to get muddy, especially if you're working with some complementaries that I will be working with later. You don't want those to just turn into a brown on your page. Now this Stampin' Up! watercolor paper is a cold press watercolor paper. So there's a little bit of texture to it, not much though. And one side is smoother than the other. So you can work with the texture to create some interesting designs, or you can flip it over to the smoother side if you're really interested in preserving some stamp detail. I obviously didn't need detail here because I'm just painting over these beautiful flowers. Now you can get some precision with your brush after the page has dried just a little bit. If you wanted to add some sharper definition to the shadows, then just move on to another flower and come back to one after it's dried and you can add some beautiful harsher lines that will indicate some detail of the flower if that's the style that you're going for. These particular colors I really, really like. I think that that fuchsia look and orange and purple just play well together. They look nice. They might not look like a real flower, but nobody cares. Now I repeat the same process with the newer flowers. First, mostly water with a little bit of pigment. And then real saturated watercolor to bleed into that. And you'll see how well that fills out that space. And you can create flowers and leaves and all kinds of great botanical shapes this way just by painting with water first and then touching the pigment to the edges. 
It gives it a surprisingly realistic look, especially with things like rose petals. Because you'll notice if you just go outside and look at them, that the colors do flow into each other. While you're looking at your painting, it's strange to watch this on video for me because to me it doesn't look the same as it does when I'm painting it. But what you'll need to do every now and then is step away and look at your painting from a distance. And I find that that's very, very helpful. You, when you're close to the page and you're close to what you're painting, sometimes you think it looks like a terrible mess, but in reality it's really beautiful. And you just need a little bit of distance from it to be able to see that the abstract shapes are really working. Another thing that I like to do is take a photograph halfway through with my iPhone, change the setting. If you're using Instagram, it's very easy to do with the Instagram app, but you can also do it with the native camera app on your iPhone or Android. And turn the photo to black and white. And when you do that, it will become very obvious that you're, either your shadows are very well done or that you need a lot more contrast, which is usually the case with me. And you will see immediately that you need to add some deeper, darker shadows to your watercolor. And I find that super helpful, easy, free, judgment-free feedback from an inanimate object. And I use that a lot whenever I can. I'm going to do the same thing on the foliage. Again, I'm really not adhering anything but very loosely to the stamp design. I don't want it to look like I drew, you know, what a leaf looks like or what a stem looks like. I really want it to be more based on color than it is on shape. And so I'm pretty free with the way that I follow the stamp design. But it's so great to have that composition there for balance and to let you know where things should be on a plant. Again, I like to go back and add a lot of yellow, especially with that lime green. It turns into a fun orangey accent that sort of mimics the flower. It looks like reflected light from the flowers themselves, and that's what I want because that's what you would normally see. Even though this isn't super realistic, I do want it to look like something you would actually see out in nature. Another great shading color for yellows and yellow greens is just a good dark blue or a turquoise. So that's what I'm adding here, just a couple accents of a dark blue that I can blend in. And that adds just a different tonal value of green that I think you'll like. A deep, deep blue is very nice too, a dark navy or even a dark blue that tends towards the violet side. Now the center of the flowers, I want to be dark like they are on the stamp image. So I go almost full strength into the center of the flowers with my dark violet brush -o. And if you just don't concentrate on what the center of that looks like, it comes out perfectly. If you do concentrate and you try to make little dots or approximate what a flower really looks like, I think you'll be disappointed with the results. So stay away from realism as much as you can if this is the technique you want to do. Now I realized that I had not filled in a couple of the petals on the two biggest flowers. And so I looked at it for a little while and then I realized I had just a tiny bit too much white space. So I filled those in and then moved on to the flower on the left to sort of fill that out. I tried to keep this one pretty pale. You can even pull a little bit of color out of what you've already painted 
if you want just the palest color possible. But as long as you put enough water there, you can add these other little highlights like yellow and then the deeper violet. And they'll travel along the water and really give you a nice look. Now I popped a little bit of magenta into the flower center as well. And then added a couple more pops of color to that leftmost flower. It's so fun to just let it bleed. Really, really nice and organic. Now I have one more lower flower to do. And these smaller, shorter ones can be even more abstract than the other two are. They're sort of in the background and they don't need as much detail as the focal points do. But I do want them to have the same colors in them. So I want to make sure that nice coral blend is there as well as just a little bit of shading with the violet. Now on the left, this one is mostly dry so I can go into the center and into some of the petals and add just some shadows that I need. This is the time when I would look at it on my iPhone and see if those darks are dark enough. Now I let that dry a little bit and that was because both of those flowers were still really wet and I wanted to be able to come in and add some petal detail with the magenta. So just walk away every now and then and let the other layers dry. And this is what will keep your watercolor from getting muddy. Even with just analogous colors, you can still get mud if you don't wait long enough for the layers underneath to dry. And depending on what kind of watercolor you're using, if it activates very easily with water, you might get a little mud too. So you just have to plan out those layers a little bit. Now I'm adding water to the background because I want to put in a little blue sky. And I'm very careful not to touch the edges of what I've already painted. So I want to let the sky color, which is the Brusho turquoise, I just want to let that fill in the areas that I have water in without going up and grabbing the pigment from the edge of the flowers just yet. I will get closer to them as the painting goes on, but right now I just want to fill these areas with a little bit of color and not mar the edges just yet. So just adding plain water works great. And you can see already that the turquoise pigment doesn't move quite as much as the yellows and the magentas do. Each color is different and you need to learn the properties of each shade in the medium that you're using. Because a brush o turquoise is going to behave differently than a fluid watercolor or a pan watercolor turquoise is. Some pigments have the same properties across mediums. Some of them can be kind of obstinate, no matter what form they come in. But you'll want to practice a lot with whatever medium you're using and just get to know each one of these colors. Now just try to fill in every area in between the flowers. And I'm actually going to add just a tiny bit of violet to the sky. You definitely don't want just one color in the sky. You want some visual interest and ideally you want a color that is also reflected in the focal point that you're working on. It's more natural that way. Just because of the way things reflect in nature. Now here's one of the petals that I forgot, so I'm kind of filling that in in these flowers. 
They don't just have a sky intruding into what should be a flower. And I'm going to turn it upside down because it's easier to get at the top part. Now I want a little bit of white space on this sky. So I'm not going to make it the same height all the way across. When I cut this down to card front size, I want there to be just a little bit of white space at the top. Now at this point, I can go in and get just a little bit closer. My painting is drying, so I'm not in as much danger as I was when the edges were wet. And I will come back and fill that in. But while it's wet, it's a good time to add the violet so that it just gets a little diffused and looks a little bit more natural. You want to try always when you're doing watercolor, you want to try to avoid going over and over and over the same area. No matter how thick and awesome your watercolor paper is, you do run the risk of taking off that top surface. And then the pigments might act a little bit differently if they're on sort of a pilly surface. So just be careful. You'll see I have a pretty light touch. And I try not to spend too much time in the same area. Now you can see some of the little specks where I have splattered the masking fluid in the background. They're not as white as they will be when I remove the masking fluid, but they are resisting the pigment just a little bit. You can see right there in the sky. And then of course there are some areas on the plants as well. Now you can already see that this guy is more interesting than it would have been if it was all just light blue. So I really encourage you to experiment with mixing colors and try not to color block when you watercolor. I'm going to go in and add just a little bit of, of a deeper blue onto the stems and the leaves. And then I'm going to add in the background, I'm going to add some little just atmospheric touches of green behind the foliage so that they are less of a focal point than the flowers are because I really want the detail of the flowers to be the star. So I'm going to just spread out just that color of the green, not so much detail, but just so that it looks like it more smoothly fades into the background. And that'll make the flowers pop just a little bit more than if I had super defined foliage. Also, it makes this sky in the background a little more interesting with that green color. And now I'm ready to eliminate some of that white space around the image by adding a little bit of the sky back in. Again, this is a combination of pulling the pigment out of the background itself, just with a wet brush, and then actually adding more pigment around the edges. It just cleans it up a little bit. And we're going to have plenty of white space with what I've left in the flowers and then also what is revealed with the masking fluid. So I don't need the white space around the flowers, even though it's a great look and you could completely leave it the way it is. It gives you good contrast between the flowers and the background. So that's just a personal preference. But I'm going to fill it in just a tiny bit. Everybody always says white space is the key to good watercolor. And I think it's one of the hardest things to do, actually. I think our inclination as stampers and people who like to color things in is to really color everything in. 
Don't leave any white space. It's not our nature. So this is kind of a tough thing to learn. But you definitely can't add it back when you're done. So you want to leave yourself something to work with in terms of white space. So now I'm just going to let that dry for a little while. I really like the way it looks. It doesn't look, looks enough like this stamp, but it doesn't look exactly like this stamp. So now I'm just testing to make sure it's dry. And then I'm going to take my adhesive eraser and erase the little dots of masking fluid. And to do this effectively, you just need to run your finger over the paper. And you'll feel where they are, and then you can pull them off. And you'll see it has just these nice little tiny round dots that are so much whiter even than the white space that I left that they just look great. They're very crisp. I probably actually should have added a few more splatters or bigger splatters. But I never know. You never know when you do it. It just is what it is. You just want to feel your way around until they're all gone. And it comes off so easily. It's really magic. The only thing is, I wish masking fluid didn't smell like a dead goat. I'm just not sure why it has to smell like that. All of it does, though. I love this particular brand. It's easy to use. It has a little dropper. But it smells like a dead goat, too. They all do. And Jennifer McGuire uses rubber cement, which is also very easy. But that also has a strong smell. I would just like one that doesn't have any smell at all. I'm kind of weird about smells in my craft room. So now that I've spent half an hour coloring it, I don't want to screw it up with the greeting. So I'm going to do it with the Misty. The greeting is from the same set that you've got this set. And I actually fell in love with some of the sentiments in this set before I even fell in love with the images. I think the script is beautiful. And it goes perfectly with kind of an all-occasion stamp set. So I'm going to go ahead and stamp that twice since it's on watercolor paper. And you can see how beautiful and crisp that is. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Hope you learned a little something about abstract watercolor. Thanks so much for watching.